So I welcome you all on the session three of day two. We have a very interesting lineup for today's speakers in session three. So one common thing for all the speakers, I would like to say that you will get 45 minutes uh, of speaking time that we have divided in 35 plus 10, that is 35 minutes speaking and 10 minutes for question and answers. So I will interrupt you when 35 minutes will over so that we can go towards question answers. So now I will invite our first speaker, Dr. Vibhu Prakash. So to introduce Dr. Vibhu Prakash, Vibhu Prakash, Dr. Vibhu Prakash heads vulture program as deputy director and principal scientist at uh, Bombay Natural History Society, BNHS. He obtained doctorate degree from University of Bombay for working on ecology of raptors at Kiyula Dev National Park, Bharatpur, Rajasthan. He has done extensive work on bird migration and have worked out on all major wetlands in the country. He has been working on birds of prey, including vultures, since 1984. The research findings have been published in international journals like Biological Conservation, Journal of Zoology, Journal of Applied Ecology, and Proceedings of Royal Society of London. And he has also published in prestigious national journals like Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. He has won prestigious prizes like Marsh Award for Wildlife Conservation, Royal Banks uh, Scotland Award for Species Conservation in 2016, and recently Prani Mitra Award 2021 from Central Zoo Authority. So I invite Dr. Vipu Prakash. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mihi. Thank uh, I'm really grateful for CCMB and uh, uh, Dr. Ojiyu Mahapati and uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk on this during this session. I will just upload my presentation. Can you see my presentation, please? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I'm audible all right? Yes. Thank you so much. So I will now, I will uh, start my presentation. I will be talking on conservation breeding program of three critically endangered gyp species of vultures in the country. So I will talk a, a bit about the vultures, their conservation status in the country and what the problems they face and uh, the what conservation measures have been taken to save the, at least the three critically endangered species from possible extinction. So vultures were very common in our country and we had an estimate of over four, 40 million vultures in the country in uh, early 80s. And uh, by mid 90s, there was a crash in vulture population and now the three most common species are, the, uh, are on the verge of extinction. That is the white pack vulture, long-billed vulture, and the slender billed vultures. So vultures were found all over in the country in urban areas, in rural areas, in forested areas, almost all over. So fortunately, uh, Bombay Natural History Society has been monitoring the vulture and raptor populations in the country. And so by mid-90s, we could uh, find out that the vulture was indeed declining. You know, when a species is found, it is very abundant, it's very difficult to make whether it's, make out whether it's declining or not, unless it's being monitored regularly. So uh, we noticed in Kevla National Park that the vulture population has declined by more than 50% by mid-90s, and by, mid by 2000, we had lost most of the population in this uh, national park. And uh, we also carry out nationwide surveys on uh, we do on identified transects across the country and we do repeat it every four years. So based on this information, we were, we knew that the vulture population has crashed all over the country and there was a decline of more than 97% of the population. And <clears throat> vultures are slow breeding and long living bird and usually the annual rate of mortality in these species is less than 5%. And if uh, the annual rate of mortality increases by more than 5%, extinction becomes a possibility. But for white pack vulture, we are looking at a mortality rate of over 43%, which was, uh, and uh, it, was, it was quite possible that the species would have gone extinct if our conservation measures were not taken. And as I said, we do uh, 
uh, monitoring every four years. So by 2007, we had lost 99% of the population of both of white backed slender bill and the long bill vultures. But since the conservation measures were initiated, uh, we noticed that the, by 2012, the population of white backed had started was not declining, it was probably going up a bit. But still, the population was very small, so there was no uh, possibility of any complacency. The long build continued to decline, and it was uh, although at a much slower rate. So, when the population of vultures started uh, declining, we started looking for reasons for the crash in both population. So the most obvious reason we could think of was food. And we looked at food availability for vultures and we found that although the food availability had declined, but there was enough food for vultures and less than 5% of the cattle carcasses available for vultures for foraging had the vultures on it. Otherwise, there were other scavengers food. And the, we also looked at habitat. So vultures are found from desert to evergreen forest and they occupy different kind of habitats and, uh, and trees species. So only thing is they uh, occupy the tallest tree in the area where they occur. So uh, we looked at habitat availability and there was no uh, major change in habitat availability for vultures in their distribution range. So we also looked at, uh, so we thought of maybe a chemical contaminant, especially pesticides are killing vultures. So we, uh, because pesticides, especially the organochlorines have created havoc with vulture, with and raptor population across the world. So we, we tried to see the pesticide load in the vulture tissues. And we, although there were pesticides, but not enough to uh, even cause breeding failure or kill the vultures. And uh, we also saw vultures uh, in, uh, in postures where they appeared sick. So we thought maybe a virus is killing them. So we collected a lot of dead vultures and when we opened them up, did a post-mortem, we found that most of them are su were suffering from visceral gout. Uh, this is a condition when there's a renal failure and the uh, kidney cannot excrete out uric acid and it gets deposited on the visceral organs. Uh, so we did, uh, we thought, may, and, and there were lesions in nervous system and a GI tract. So we thought maybe a virus is killing him. So we did isolate a very virulent herpes virus. But while this research was going on, there were scientists in Pakistan from Peregrine Fund, a NGO of US. They are also working on vultures and they had similar findings, except that they found that all the vultures which are dead, which died of, uh, had visceral gout, had also residues of a drug called diclofenac which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug given to cattle for pain and inflammation. So those scientists, they orally fed vultures on diclofenac and through buffalo meat and uh, the vultures died showing very similar symptoms. So it was very clear indication the vultures were indeed dying of diclofenac. So when they found that diclofenac was a problem in Pakistan, we also uh, looked at the vulture tissues which we had collected in India and uh, stored at Vulture Conservation Green Center at Pinjor. And we found that 90, that 86 percent of our vulture had died of visceral gout, and all the vultures which had died of visceral gout also has reduced of diclofenac. So it was a very clear indication that the vultures were indeed dying in India also of diclofenac. And we had collected vultures from across the country. So uh, diclofenac is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's given to cattle in pain and inflammation. It's a wonder drug for cattle and humans. And uh, it gives immediate relief in pain within 15 minutes because it can uh, break brain blood barrier. But unfortunately, if a cattle dies and vulture feeds on it, uh, a cattle dies within 50, 72 hours of administration, vulture feeds on it, it dies of visceral gout and is extremely top, renal toxin. So once we knew that the vultures were dying of, of uh, diclofenac poisoning, it was very difficult to understand how only diclofenac could have killed millions of vultures in the country. So we, and uh, especially when in our country, a very small population of cattle is actually treated. Only 5% of the cattle is actually treated. And it was too much of a coincidence that a cattle is given diclofenac and dies within 72 hours and vultures feed on it. And then they die of... Uh, and uh, uh, diclofenac toxicity. 
So we did a mathematical modeling with the help of Professor Rhys Green of Cambridge University. We did it through the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. And we asked him for uh, our answer of how many, of how much diclofenac should be, be there in the system which could cause the kind of crash vulture population was seen. And looking at the vulture ecology, foraging ecology, and its and the toxicity of diclofenac, he came out with a figure that if if 0.8% of the ungulate carcasses available to vultures for foraging of diclofenac, it can cause this kind of crash in vulture population. So we did. Uh, vulture or cattle carcass sampling across the country. We collected liver samples from over 2,000 cattle in diff from different parts of the country, and we found that over 11% of the carcasses had diclofenac residues in them. So there was a lot of diclofenac in the system, which could have caused the crash in the population. So we uh, uh, we knew that diclofenac was killing vultures, and we had lost 99% uh, of the population. We prepared a vulture recovery plan, which was incorporated in Government of India Action Plan for Vulture Conservation 2006. And the action plan gave three important recommendations. One was to add for uh, was identification of a safer alternative to diclofenac, because you know diclofenac is a very effective drug for cattle and for humans. And uh, Minister of Agriculture was reluctant to ban it unless there was an alternative to diclofenac, because we have a huge dairy industry and uh, there's a welfare issues for treating cattle. And then the se uh, second recommendation was, to, of course, was on a ban for veterinary use of diclofenac because it was found extremely toxic to vultures. And, and since we had lost 99% of the population, it was thought that unless active conservation measures are taken, the vulture population could go extinct. So a vulture conservation creation program was so recommended to be set up. Although well, conservation breeding programs are not the best of conservation option, but it does uh, save species from extinctions. For example, Californian condor, a uh, vulture from North America, which where the population has reduced to just 22 birds and they caught all of them, did a conservation breeding program. And now they have over 500 vultures in, in wild and in captivity. And there are numerous other examples where conservation breeding program has saved species from extinction. So we did a global search for various drugs which are used for treating vultures and raptors, uh, especially the NSAIDs, the painkiller. And we found there's one drug called meloxicam, which has never caused mortality in any vulture or raptor in captivity. So we safety tested this drug on our vultures with the help of Indian Veterinary Research Institute. And we found that meloxicam was a safe drug for vultures because, you know, whenever there's NSA toxicity, there's a spike in uric acid levels of the vultures because there's a renal fail. But when uh, diclofenac is given, there's a spike in uric acid level, but when meloxicam is given, there is no uh, change in the bird parameters. And meloxicam, as you know, is a second generation drug with a fewer side effects. The only side, downside with meloxicam is a slow acting drug and it shows its results only at three, four hours. And it also is not antiparatic, but nevertheless, it's a much better drug, fewer side effect. So we recommended use of meloxicam instead of diclofenac and government of India promptly banned the use of diclofenac in 2006 for veterinary use and instead suggested that meloxicam should be used for treating cattle. But very soon we realized that although there was a ban on diclofenac, the vultures continued to die. And we found out that it was largely because there was misuse of human formulations of diclofenac in treating cattle. And as you know, in our country, there are a lot of people who are not trained. They also treat animals. And that was, was the problem. Because diclofenac is very effective and multi-dose vials for human use are available. So people who treat cattle, they buy these multi-dose vials. And typically you require only 10 to 15 ml for treating the cattle. So they buy a human formulation and you give it on cattle and the vultures continue to die. So we recommended government of India to reduce the uh, presentation, the wild size of uh, for humans just to 3 ml. And uh, they fortunately, they issued a no notification in 2015 that human formulation should show, be shown only in 3 ml wilds. And that will really save, uh, have a good impact on the population. So we continue to monitor 
cattle carcasses across the cemetery just to see what is being used to treating cattle and if there are toxic drugs used for uh, treating cattle. So, we, uh, so conservation action could be taken. And by 2013, we realized that the use of diclofenac has really come down. And there was just less than 2% of the cattle carcasses which had uh, diclofenac. And we hope that with the ban on uh, multi dose vials for human use, it will further come down. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we have, we have also found out that there are other drugs like ketoprofene, which is also an NSA it may cause mortality in vultures. And the other uh, drug called esclofenac, which is in fact a pro-drug of diclofenac, uh, because as soon as it's given to cattle, it gets converted into diclofenac, is available for veterinary use, and it causes the same kind of problem that diclofenac is. And <clears throat> a drug called nemosolide, which is also an NSA has been found associated with visceral gout, in vultures. So we have now recommended, requested government of India to consider a ban of these three drugs in veterinary use. And so the environment continues to be uh, toxic to vultures and not very safe for vultures in the wild. So uh, uh, as I said, we have lost 99% of the vulture population, but the 1% population which remains runs into thousands and they are found in different parts of the country. So we have identified the pockets where vulture population is found and we are trying to save these population by creating vulture safe zone or diclofix, uh, diclofenac free zones around in 100 kilometers radius from this, where these populations are. And these areas will also be used for, the, uh, for releasing or reintroducing the uh, vultures we bred in captivity or conservation breeding program. We have now eight different Provisional vulture safe zone. We have been working to, to, to uh, make sure they are safe for vultures, and they are different parts of the country. So now I will come to vulture conservation breeding program, which is being done of three species: the white back, oriental white back, long billed and slender billed vulture. So we, uh, we, uh, the Central Zoo Authority has developed a, a vulture can, uh, a manual for vulture conservation breeding from. Uh, for better management of all the centers, and there's a uniformity in management for better results. So to uh, to, uh, to see how much, how many vultures we should breed, ideally to uh, for a conservation breeding program, because it's not difficult to breed vultures, but if you keep them in the right environment. So we did a mathematical formula for that, we, and we came out with a figure that if you can release 600 pairs of each of the three species in the wild, that will form a viable, genetically viable self-sustaining population. And to get 600 pairs of the, of the three species in wild, we thought of having six different centers just to avoid putting all the eggs in one basket from, and from each center, we thought of housing 25 pairs in each of the center and produce 100 pairs from each of the center and release them in the wild. So vultures are slow breeding and long living birds. So we, and you can age a vulture only till it is five years old. So we collected our vultures either as nestlings or one-year-old birds. So it took them five to six years old, six years to start breeding. And we kept the first F1 generation with us also for as a founder population. And now uh, we will be releasing the uh, F2 generation of the birds in the wild. So there are now eight different uh, conservation breeding centers in the country in different parts of the country. And four are being run by Bombay Natural Society and the State Forest Department, like the Pinjor, Rajabhat Kawa in West Bengal, Rani in Assam, and Bhopal in, West, in uh, Central India. The rest of the centers are run by the state zoos in collaboration with the Central Authority. So this is a typical layout plan of a conservation breeding center. The conservation breeding center is established within the distribution range of the species. And they're away from the uh, uh, human population, but not very far from big cities to get good veterinary facilities. And we have different areas for various purposes. We are very conscious of disease issues in birds. So we have a very good quarantine facility, which is usually 10 to 15 kilometers away from a vulture center. So the birds brought for the center are kept in these quarantine facilities for 45 days. And after giving a thorough health check, we especially against chronic head disease, which has a incubation period of 45 days and which is very prevalent. 
the vultures are brought to the center if they are nestlings they are kept in the aviaries and if they are one or two years old bird they are kept in boarding aviaries and they, if they are more than 3 years old bird they are kept in uh, colony aviaries which are 100 feet long 40 feet wide and 20 feet high uh since birds are uh, vultures are social birds they have to be kept in flocks so uh, 15 to 20 pairs are kept in colony aviaries which have good all facilities for vultures to breed they have nesting ledges they have it's quite well ventilated it has just one top uh, uh net lawn netting so vultures even they hit they don't get injured and uh, there's the facility for water we food is just uh, slide it in, is especially the goat carcasses, and there's very little human interference uh, as these vultures have to be released back to the wild. So when you keep uh, a big size raptor like a vulture, which weighs over five kilos, uh, the, the main problem of keeping such big birds in captivity is they tend to be sitting most of the time, while in wild, 60% of the time, they're in air. So they've developed pressure sores in their feet, which can get infected and they develop a bubble foot. And that is very difficult to treat. It's a bacterial disease, but it's very difficult to treat. So, but it can be avoided if you give them rough surface to perch on. And that we do by giving them, we wound coconut rope or the perches and that uh, prevents bubble foot. And <clears throat> otherwise, if the vultures are kept in a flock, they, are, they get very uh, easily adapted to the environment and don't struggle or, and easily breed. The aviaries are well ventilated. It is all a near natural situation where these vultures are kept. The only thing which they cannot do in these aviaries is so, which we cannot provide in conservation breeding program. So we have various other aviaries for other purposes also. Since all the vulture conservation breeding centers are off display, so we have a display every where we can we keep birds which are not for breeding and they can be displayed to public whenever uh, in a designated area. So we do have breeding areas where we keep birds or pairs which are not comfortable breeding in colony every situation and we have a hospital every for clinics of birds. All our birds are marked because of the conservation breeding program. So we have a wing tag. We also ring them uh, by a ring ring. We also put a microchip, which is almost a permanent marker, and we keep all their morphometrics electronically. We catch them once in a year and do a thorough health check, and uh, we usually don't treat them unless, and don't give them any vaccines because they have to be sent back to the wild. But we monitor their health by doing uh, bleeding 10% of the uh, bird population and, all, and keep the fecal, check the fecal sample uh, samples regularly. We do have a good lab where we can do hematology, biochemistry, we monitor the uric acid levels and vultures are not sexually dimorphic so we have to take the help of DNA and uh, we have a small molecular biology lab also where we can sex vultures and also a microbiology lab to study the gut flora of vultures, especially to treat sick birds because nothing was known about uh, vulture microflora. And we are very careful, food is very important in conservation breeding program, very, and we are very conscious about it. Uh, since uh, uh, NSAIDs are a problem, so we keep, we feed vultures on goats or buffaloes. So we, we keep them for uh, uh, 10 days. So if a goat is treated with diclofenac or any NSAIDs, it is excreted out within 10 days, and then, the goats are skinned, slaughtered, skinned, and the entire carcass is offered to the vultures. And we feed them twice a week. And one vulture gets about four to five kilos meat per week based on its body weight. And that works out to be 5% of its body weight per day. And vultures are uh, social birds and they feed uh, collaboratively. There is hardly any fight. The hundred. Hungry birds is in fact more dominant and the bird which has fed, it gives way. And they, they are very fast feeders. They finish up everything within minutes. But we don't remove the skeletons for 15 days because birds, these vultures, they work on the tendons, release bones, and they swallow big bones to meet their cultural requirement. 
so the vultures they love to take baths especially after meal and they they would bathe only when there is uh, fresh water so we have to top up water the water troughs every day and here also there are hardly any fights is almost uh, one by one because they are social birds and they have to live together and most of their actions are uh, activities are synchronized because of being social which is helpful in food search so once they have uh, they usually when there is bright sunshine they usually dry themselves open the wings more to shed ectoparasites and for thermal protections and you see how comfortable these birds are in captive situation also since they are kept in captivity and they have enough place to fly, fly around so the nesting starts from september october and uh, it happens as is happens in the wild the birds they uh, uh, pair up when they are 3 3 years old and they pair for life and once they pair up they identify a nest ledge which they nest regularly year after year on the same ledge and uh, uh, they only they defend the nest ledge uh, otherwise other birds get up close to it so so they are not very territorial incubation period is for 55 days and both the sexes take equal part in incubation so uh, both the birds are most of the time uh, close to the nest the one bird is always on the nest because it's in winter it's just quite cold so they keep a close eye on the egg and they roll the egg at least nine times a day to keep it warm from all the sides so embryo doesn't stick <clears throat> the chick hatches after uh, uh, after 50 days it starts calling from inside that is the internal pip and 53 days it there is an external pip and 55 days it hatches and the parents they brood the chick for at least 45 days because till the time the thermoregulation is developed but the, they start feeding the chick right from the sec first day on uh, on the meat from the uh, crop the vultures have a crop at the base of their neck from uh, they bring they bring food in the crop and uh, uh, they regurgitate in the nest and the vulture chick picks it up from the nest and it is uh, when a vulture chick is is hatched it is about just 150 grams but within 4 months it becomes 4 kilos so the calcium requirement is very high so they are feed, fed on big bones also with brought by the parents so the vultures lay only one egg per year but uh, but if the egg is lost within uh, three weeks or a month they tend to lay again and vulture centers they take advantage of this so we remove the egg within 15 days of incubation and are incubated artificially in the meantime the vultures lay again and then uh, uh, in this way we are trying to increase the productivity of vultures because uh, if one egg is lost one year is all gone and there are many a times the young parents lay just on the ground and the egg is wasted and so we pick it up and do artificial incubation and we have been very successful in doing it so within 10 to 15 days we pick up the uh, egg of uh, so it is good if there is some natural incubation so the egg the weight uh, loss trend sets in and the incubation uh, uh, embryo is also more stable we should not leave the eggs for more than a month or so and then because they will chance of devil and scratching reduces so this is how we take the egg we go in front of the uh, uh, parents we climb up the nest and the vultures don't usually defend the nest and we take the egg bring it down uh, carefully to the incubation incubator room incubator rooms are thermo controlled where temperature is maintained at 20 to 21 degrees and uh, the uh, relative humidity is uh, of the room uh, uh, and uh, incubation temperature is 36.3 to 36.9 and over the years we know that this is the optimum temperature for hatching we have not good sanitation protocol we have we keep only essential equipment in the incubator room and there is access and only dedicated staff are allowed inside so we can keep four eggs in one uh, incubator it's a tabletop 
forced air heating system. It's a very, very nice incubator. And we roll, we can roll the eggs three times a day. And the incubator also sits on a cradle, which rolls once in a uh, and once an hour. And we candle the eggs six uh, every six days just to see the development of chick. And we monitor the increase in the uh, air sac. So uh, uh, for successful hatching, the egg should lose 17, 15 to 17 percent of its weight from lay to pip. So we mm, we measure the weight loss every uh, every three days, and we try to make sure that uh, it is losing enough weight. If it is not losing enough weight, we tend to drill it, or if it's losing too much weight, we increase the humidity in the incubator. And uh, 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 by uh, 50th day, they should start calling because there's, there's a time when pulmonary respiration initiated and you can hear it uh, if you put it against your uh, ear. And by 53rd day, it should uh, crack or external pep and by 55th day, it should hatch. And if it has crashed and it's not hatching, then we have to increase the humidity and then usually it hatches. So if we have a fertile egg, we have been able to hatch the egg successfully. Once the egg uh, uh, externally pip it, pips externally, we move it to the uh, brooder room because we keep only intact eggs in the incubator rooms. And they are kept together and where humidity is very high, it's above the air and where they hatch. So they are uh, moved to the brooder room and every day temperature is reduced by one degrees. And then they are shifted to the uh, nursery areas. So when they are born, they have a very sparse coat of down, so they cannot thermoregulate. A newly hatched chick is not fed for first 12 hours and it gets food from its yolk, but subsequently it's fed three times a day and on very measured food quantities. And we monitor its weight gain. In first three days, the weight gain should not be more than 7% per day. And from third day to 20 day, not more than 9% and so on. And if you can uh, have, we have developed a weight gain chart. And if you can maintain that, we have successful fragging cookies. So from third day onward, we start getting, uh, first day we gave only muscles. And the third day onwards, we start giving uh, small portions of all parts of the body of, of different organs, including the bones from the ribs. <clears throat> we, uh, vultures' eyesights are not, not very developed in 10 days, so we ha uh, hand rear it, and uh, but on very measured quantity of food. And then uh, after 10 days, we don't usually uh, handle them very much when they are kept together in after three days of hatching, they are also kept in sun to get vitamin D3 or calcium assimilation. And they are raised together, so they imprint on each other, not on us. So what we do now, we take the first clutch and incubate it ourselves. And in the meantime, the parents lay again. And when the egg hatches in an incubator, and, it, and when it is 10 days old, we give the chick back to the parents and we take the second class. Parents take it very easily because their olfactory sense is not developed. And if they are in breeding mode, they readily accept it. And this way we have been able to increase the productivity significantly. This is how we do chick swapping. When it is 10 to 15 days old, we give it back to the parents and we take the egg very carefully and we take, follow all the has uh, hygiene, has sanitation protocol, so there's no infection. And we bring the back egg to the uh, incubator room, rear it ourselves. And this is how we rear them uh, out in the nursery every in flocks. So they don't, they imprint onto each other. And uh, once they grow up, we give them individual cots or net cots to grow together, in, but they are kept in one area. So we have uh, managed to breed all the three critically endangered species, the long-billed, white-backed, and slender-billed vulture for the first time ever. So this, is, this ensures that 
uh, like the objective of constitutional breeding that which ensures that at least these three species will not go extinct. Now we have got uh, seven, um, over 70, 780 birds in different centers. And most of the birds you'll see are in Pinjar, Baksa and Rani, which are managed by Mama Natural Society. And in Pinjar, since we do artificial incubation and double clutching, we have put birds. We breed, we breed almost 400, we have bred all, most than 444 birds so far, <laughs> most of them from Pinjar. And since now we have <laughs> been able to, we are successful in breeding birds and Aclofinac uh, uh, levels have also gone down. So we have started, we, had, we have thought of reintroducing birds in the wild. So we have started doing it from Pinjar as well as from Rajabad Kawa in West Bengal. <clears throat> so uh, we, have, we have decided to do soft release of, as opposed to the hard release. And we have kept, we keep birds in pre-release every for a good number of uh, time, good amount of time. Till then, uh, they have interaction with the wild birds. And also they know, they get used to the sur sur surroundings where they will be released. And our centers are off display, but when you have to release birds, you need public support. So in, we invited public figures to release birds in the pre-release area, and it generated a lot of uh, enthusiasm in the general public. And there was reduction in use of that also after the visit of the dignitaries. So this is a pre-release every The birds are kept in an area where they have to be released and they can see all around, although it is covered, crows can get into it so they know what they should expect once they are released back in the wild. So we also uh, attract free ranging birds just outside the pre-release every just to have interaction with our captive bred birds. We, we believe if our captive bred birds and these free ranging birds have good interaction, then captive bred birds will join them, then they have a better chance of survival in the wild. So although we know the way we have kept birds in captivity, when we release them, they will be able to fly and look for food, but there was some skepticism. So what we did, we first released two Himalayan griffins, which are not critically endangered, and they were with us for over 10 years. So we first released them on 3rd of June, 2016, to see what happens when the birds, which have been kept in captivity for so long, whether they were going to fly or find food and what. And uh, Honorable Minister Union Minister came to release these birds remotely through a pulley. He pulled up the netting and the birds were free to release, go in the wild. And within 45 days, these birds started flying around. They also started soaring. They could find their own food and water. And uh, those days, we didn't have permission put, uh, to put a satellite tag on them. So we had just put a wing tag. So we could follow them for 45 days. And we were very happy with these results. As you can see, this bird is flying. It is avoiding all the obstructions. It is flying through the power pylons. And it is also gaining height through the thermals, which the vultures do. So, and this is a bird which was in captivity for 10 years. So encouraged by these results, we have now, uh, uh, we decided to release our critically endangered species in the wild. And uh, uh, so um, uh, in 2020, we released birds from uh, Pinjaw Center as well as from Rajabhat Khao. So we released eight birds from uh, Pinjaw Center on uh, in October 2020 and 10 birds from Rajabhat Khawa in, in January 2021. All the, uh, the birds were wild caught and they were two three years old and there were two birds, uh, all the birds were captive bred and only two birds were wild caught. So we had put uh, satellite tags on them as well as wing tags and four of the birds we had put uh, the GSM tags on uh, as backpacks. So we uh, released them on the 8th of October at Pinjar and the netting was remotely lifted from a height which was about 50 meters away. The birds didn't leave for 48 days and then gradually they started leaving the area. Although we were hoping that all these birds will go out together and join the white flock, 
but that didn't happen and the words went in different direction but uh, uh, we could track them because they had uh, satellite tag on them and but uh, uh, we had to provision food uh, uh, and uh, uh, and also make sure that they are alive and this is how they are now in 50 to 100 meters from the center and remember these birds are not migratory so we don't expect them to fly very far but uh, so far uh, they have survived and uh, uh, they are doing well, but so. But before releasing birds, we make sure that the environment in hundred kilometers radius from the release area is safe. So we monitor vulture population, we monitor food availability, we also see habitat availability, and see what the use of drugs in the hundred kilometers area. And they, if, if there is no other threat to vultures. Today. So we have found that the use of meloxicam, the safe drug, is going up and diclofenac is coming down, but still there. But use of nimesulide, acyclofenac is coming up, which is a cause of worry. But we are working with the authorities to make sure that these drugs, use of these drugs also goes down. Well, so food, we, we don't think there's much problem. There is now food more at carcass dumps and uh, there is uh, enough food for vultures to survive. And, and we have seen that there are a number of carcasses which are not even attempted to talks. So we do uh, an aggressive advocacy program by calling drug controllers of different states to our vulture centers, explaining to them what is happening and what is the cause of problem. And when the uh, officers come to the center with the, the drug and chemist association people, it has a very big impact and the use of drugs really come down. But it's a long way to go and we have to do a lot of hard work to make sure that we are safe. We also call other stakeholders like the forest department people, the local government people, the government people, senior officers of the Ministry of Environment and Forest and explain to them what has been done and what needs to be done to save vultures from uh, extinction and for their conservation. So we are not alone. Thank you so much. This is what I have to say. We are not alone. We have uh, support from Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change, Government of India, right from the beginning. And uh, we have our uh, trusted partner, Royal Society of Protection Work. We have been uh, giving us technical advice as well as uh, funds for running the program for almost 20 years now. And we got funding from Dharma Initiative Survival Species, the UK Government Fund. We have got technical support from International Center for Birds of Prey of UK. They have been very, very supportive. Our veterinary support comes from Zoological Society of London and the Indian Veterinary Research Institute. And of course, Wildlife Institute supports in many ways. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Vibhu Prakash. That was a very informative talk. And uh, we have a few questions. First from Mr. Bipul. Is there an action plan developed for vulture breeding and reintroduction in Jharkhand? Well, the, uh, uh, the government of India has developed a vulture uh, action plan for vulture conservation 2025, which also includes Jharkhand. It, uh, 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 it supports a, a vulture conservation breeding center at Muta. In, and yes, there is a, there's a plan. And we have a question from Raj Mohan. Is there any simpler method to identify the presence of diclofenac in the reserved forest? Because it is difficult to depend on the laboratory every time. Yes, I, unfortunately, it's not possible. We did try developing a ELISA-based kit, which, and we were not successful. So the only way of finding out diclofenac residues is uh, we need a sophisticated lab, and it takes a lot of time. So that's why at our breeding centers, we make sure that we feed vultures only on, car uh, on carcasses where we know the animals are with us for 10 days because all the diclofenac is excreted out. So yeah, it's it's very difficult to find if a carcass has any safety. And uh, Dr. Umapati has three questions. Sir, you can unmute yourself and then you can ask. Okay. 
I was asking uh, that is there anything uh, the development in natural uh, population is there anything stabilized following the cliffhanger uh, ban or what is the, what is the situation in natural population as of now? Well, uh, uh, you know we 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 do uh, a, a nationwide vulture count every four years, but we have not been able to do for last two years. But the general, uh, uh, wherever we are doing observations, we know the vulture population is stabilizing and increasing. But uh, 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 the worry is that there are certain other drugs which have also been found toxic, so we have to be careful. But certainly because uh, the use of diclofenac has come down, population have started increasing and stabilizing. My other question uh, is about, uh, is there anything you find difference among this species, their breeding efficiency in captivity? Well, uh, the slender bill vulture is, uh, is, uh, is little, uh, here the hatchability is uh, it, it little, it's lower than the other two species. Okay. And you know, when uh, like you know, for long bill vulture, we collected most of them as young birds or juveniles. But for other species, we have also collected rescued birds and adults. So we have found that the hatchability and breeding is much more, is much better in long bird vultures than the other two species. Uh, thank you, uh, Kobe. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one more question from uh, Mr. Bikram Pradhan. What is the optimum temperature and time period for incubation? Well, the optimum temperature which we have found is 36.3 to 36.9 in the incubators. And uh, time period, uh, it takes 55 days for of incubation. Incubator. And similar is in the wild world. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vibhu. Uh, you, yes. Uh, now I request uh, Mihir to introduce our next speaker, Parag Jyoti Deka. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Parag Teka. After finishing his postgraduate studies in veterinary science from Assam Agricultural University, Dr. Parag Jyoti Deka began his career as project officer of Pygmy Hawk Conservation Program in Guwahati in 1997. At first, he was engaged in veterinary support, healthcare, management, and breeding of captive critically endangered pygmy hawk. Later, as project manager, he became involved in habitat restoration, reintroduction, and monitoring of introduced hawks in sub Himalayan grassland of Assam in addition to previous responsibilities. His training in breeding and conservation of endangered species in Dural Academy in UK and effective conservation translocation in the USA contributed to this work and finally resulted in release of uh, 142 captive bred pygmy hawk in the wild. Since the beginning of 2018, he has taken responsibility of leading the program as project director of PHCP and program manager of TSRP formed in 2018 along with Aranyuk. So I invite you, Dr. Parag, to take up for your presentation. Good morning to all, and thank you, Mihir, for a nice introduction. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Mm, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll uh, in this my present presentations. What I'll do, I briefly uh, uh, introduce the project, and then I'll talk mostly about the breeding and then if I have time, then I'll go, go and tell you the detail of what we are planning and what how, how we are going ahead. So the, project, the species was uh, discovered in 1990, sorry, some problem is not moving. Mihir, I could not move my slides. Who's uh, uh, keyboard down of arrow? No, it's not working for some reason. Uh, yeah, Doctor Parag, you can I come out of slides and again start. Not happening right now. You can, you can unshare. I... You can unshare and uh, you ah, come you out. Then once you can share. You can yeah, come maybe. out and again start. The huge is maybe. Okay. Maybe because of. Uh, Size of 
your file is big maybe size that's the reason yeah uh, maybe that's why that's why should i say new share saying uh, no or uh, stop sharing yes yeah yeah uh, do it. Yeah. Again. yeah uh no same problem okay maybe size is more big big share can you see it now uh, now it's there the full screen is not there slide sir yeah i'll make a slide so maybe can i see it now yeah so yeah. this this is was yeah. discovered in 1847 from the food hill of himalaya close to assam but it was thought to be extinct in 1964 uh, uh, by a scientist called piggy but someone was really think that is maybe somewhere so he inspired a tea garden manager from a jersey to look for it in assam and in 1971 it was rediscovered from a borno de wild life sanctuary close to borno de wild life sanctuary so he sent immediately his uh, scientific staff dal dal sent it to assam in 1977 william oliver he came and he did a research on the pygmy hawk he captured pygmy hawk couple of pygmy hawk from borno de and then a radio telemetry study and try to understand and he found the population of the pygmy hog in in the entire assam himala region particularly in in assam but in 1995 and 2003 if you know the history of assam there was a severe socio political unrest in assam uh, and there was uh, because of that uh, the the entire area was badly suffered and particularly in the manas tessel park where pygmy hog was uh, the home home of the pygmy hog it would their protection was lost and uh, all riders are get killed down and then the entire place was suffered very badly and there was really poor protections in that area so all conservationists or particularly the red wildlife conservation trust was very worried about the uh, situation of the manas and also the pygmy hawk so there were many conservation challenges of the habitat particularly itself because habitat is a dynamic habitat it keep on changing from grassland to woodland there was a burning reason for managing the habitat and because of also some anthropogenic pressure but because of lack of protections and this all these uh, natural challenges and particularly also the anthropogenic pressures so it was become more and more and then the most of the habitat great degraded i think we lost 60% of the habitat Uh, during that period so pygmy hawk was in 1993 it was stuck only in manas national park so there, there some action need to be initiated uh, for this highly threatened species found only in one place otherwise it would have been uh, extinct by uh, if we don't do anything so we need a very broad scale effort and uh, a long term effort to save the species from extinction in uh, 1993 wild pig population uh, specialist group uh, they design uh, a action plan and based on the action plan a recovery plan was designed which is to look for a viable action plan so it is site specific management actions so time and cost was estimated and a recovery criteria was established so final outcome was downlisting or the delisting the species from critically endangered to uh, the lower, lower level Darul Wild Oil uh, Conservation Trust was doing the conservation work in 14 different countries with uh, many smaller species so we have expertise in house and with that expertise in 1995 pygmy hawk conservation program was uh, formed with uh, collaborations with the wild pig specialist group then our state forest department and uh, MOF and the local partner uh, ecosystems india joined the partnership in 2002 and 2018 are in the journey as a partner we have uh, supporters of the different institutions in, in the entire time of the project so so why we do the conservation bidding uh, because uh, as you know it was facing the threat of extinction and we must also acquire knowledge and also create a source populations for the introduction that was the ultimate goal of the entire project but do we have uh, Uh, enough uh, knowledge on the populations yes we know some about about the species because we have did a study there it was in the uh, zoos couple of zoos before 
we know from where we can really capture the animal. There was a fun space, a logistic, because we have a partnership, and there was a re really, really strong commitment from the organization. Also, individual commitment matters. So we have uh, Gautam and William, who started this project in 1995. So in the entire project time, we, we brought, initially we brought six pygmy hawk to the captivity in one of our breeding center near Guwahati. And 2001, one more animal was rescued. And 2013, three more animals was caught and brought to the big uh, breeding center. Uh, but how we manage? So we really need to find out how we manage the population in captivity. So there was two objectives clearly, uh, creating a healthier populations what sort of health. I think we've talked about psychological health and physical health. And at the same time, if we need to really maintain a good populations in long term, we should be looking for uh, genetic health and the demographic health. How we achieve that? So to achieve that, what we did, we designed a model of managing the population in captivity, which should be a stress-free captive environment and stress-free captive management protocols like we call them a happy hogs. So happy hogs are healthy and happy hogs exhibit natural behavior so that we, we can have a good breeding because of they are healthy and they exhibit natural behavior. And healthy hogs and exhibit natural behavior are really fit for release into the wild. Or how we achieve that? So we look for, everybody said in last two, three speakers that we should be thinking about all the welfare active, uh, welfare of the animals. So we consider all these five freedom of the animals and how we have done it. So what we do in our uh, captive uh, enclosures, we try to copy it from nature and try to incorporate some of the components of the nature, like from Manas, what they have. They have a grassland and we have a small water hole. So we created lots of grasses in our paddocks and there was scope for them to cut the grass and build the nest. They live on a nest. They really need a nest or throughout the year. It's uh, just that they cut and make it like a thatch roof. And then eat lots of uh, uh, ants and termites. So we provide environment so that the ants and termites grow on the paddocks so that they can uh, really dig around and spend their time. So that's how we address their uh, psychological environment. So we give them a behavioral security. Food, we don't know what they eat uh, because there is no enough information. So what we did, we trial at least 65 different food items. I try to find out what they really eat and give them in combinations of food, at least four in the morning and four in the afternoon. And restaurant handling is very important. If, uh, if our hogs, if you capture it and if you hold it for more than like five minutes, then their temperatures goes like high. So we have to design our own restraint and handling protocols. And even we studied during one of our anesthesia study with a pygmy hog, when we collected the blood and we found that it, it's really, really high at the beginning, then it, it really reduced if we use a sedation. So we really, if we really need to capture it more than four or five minutes, we use a sedative. And how we transport them also very important, the transport crates and temples boxes. So that's how we design our restaurant and handling protocols. Of course, the hygiene protocols and healthcare protocols, and uh, we have uh, like a uh, healthcare um, uh, system. Uh, we don't any use any chemicals in our um, paddocks and also our enclosures because if we use any chemicals, this chemical go, can go to the soil and these hogs may eat uh, those soil, soil and they may have a side effect. So what we do basically, we use a fire uh, to clean the, uh, their paddocks. Basically, we use a blow torch. But uh, I'll tell you, we have changed all the entire protocol after arrival of a very deadly disease of pigs later on. Now. Uh, really managing the population's uh, 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 genetic health and demographic health. As you know, the objective is to maximize the long-term genetic diversity with retaining the demographic stability and minimizing inbreeding. Uh, uh, and then they should retain the genetic characteristic of the original wild founder with uh, good demography. But the challenge was 
to start a bidding program with a very small number of founders. It was a really, really headache for us, uh, but we have overcome that. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, record keeping system. All animals are numbered and these records were kept in a different system. And then I will tell you more detail about this. And then those data are used for uh, creating breeding plan and uh, management plan. So what we have in record keeping system. So our keepers keep notes. We have uh, a Excel uh, templates to register the movement of the animal, the veterinary records. Then we it goes to a start book and it is designed in a spreadsheet. Uh, all data goes uh, to that start book uh, of the animal. Then we use a, a software called a single a Spark, single population analysis and record keeping system. It was uh, uh, by, by the species 365 at this, today. Uh, their huge initial name was ISIS, but they had changed their name to 365 for obvious reason. So all data goes to the, uh, the Sparks. Uh, now uh, in zoo community, they are moving from, because the star pass is a DOS based system. It's, it's not easy to work and in DOS system still, but we still are using uh, Sparks. But a new system is already here. It's called Zips. And everybody was, uh, my people start migrating from Sparks to Zips, but we are still using the uh, Sparks. Zips is a, uh, I think online system, so it is a little bit difficult. We our sites are a bit remote, so sometimes we won't be able to get the network kind of thing. But we are happy to use for at this moment, happy to use the Sparks. But Spark is just a start book management system, but for a proper pedigree analysis and proper uh, breeding plan, uh, we need a different kind of or advanced software. Earlier. They are in under Sparks, there is a system called Zins, uh, and you can use the Zins to design your breeding plan, but it was not very sophisticated. You have to take many decisions by yourself. And it, it can also tell, tell you the inbreeding coefficient, and it can tell you, you can, can easily make the your what is called uh, a pedigree chart, but it is not uh, very useful for a better. Uh, genetic planning. So what we did, we use a, another software we, when it came. Initially, it was called PM2000. Now it is uh, PMX. So in this software, there are many different tools, but two mostly used tools is a uh, demography section and then genetic sections. In demography sections, it will determine the demography trends and the prospect for the populations. And in genetic section, it is used to determine the genetic health of the population and which pairing will be to be best to maintain that health. So we use this uh, PMX for some time. If, if, if you see the analysis of the, uh, this uh, genetic, uh, demographic section, then you can see here, when we start these uh, populations in 1996, we initially concentrate on uh, bring, bringing the population to certain level, then start working on the habitat, then start reintroduction. But there are between, some crash between because there was this problem with the space. So we actually stopped breeding for some time. And uh, in that time, we, we use uh, six separation techniques. Also in one occasions, we use a control bidding technique or uh, use an injectable um, contraceptive called Depoprovara. I'll tell you a bit later, maybe. Then uh, from 2008, we start sending the animal back to the wild. So population is like that time is down. But in 2019, again, we stopped the, uh, for one year, not sending any anima animal to the reintroductions. But we have 2020, we, have, we are again sending the animal to the wild. Uh, if you see our current genetic diversity is from this software, it tells us 0 0.887 and our lambda is 1.152. There is a slight decline some, somewhere here. And very recent publications uh, with the CCMB, thanks to the CCMB, 
Uh, it also shows the similar trend that there was slight decline in the uh, genetic diversities in the populations. So perhaps in a couple of years later, we need to think about uh, incorporating few more wild blood to our populations uh, for continuation of the captive populations uh, for for some for, for, for a long time. And then how we pair them? What what do you, what uh, index we we use for pairing? So we basically use uh, an index called Met Suitability Index, MSI. And when this MSI, uh, what they do? They uh, they uh, integrate the four genetic components to give you a single index called a delta GD. Uh, when you pair a populations, what will be the uh, genetic diversity of that population is it positive or negative to consider that. Then difference in men can see value. Uh, what will be the populations? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the is men can see value of this uh, offspring. Then inbreeding coefficients. Also un ancestry. Suppose you don't know ancestry of the few individuals. Then what uh, what will be the effect? So they consider all these. Uh, to give you an index, and index value is like one to six, and you can pair up to any value. One, one is best pair, but after you can consider up to one or two or three. Occasionally four, which is slightly detrimental, but never five and six. So we follow this uh, MSI index to select our pairs, and then uh, occasionally we also look uh, the mean kinship of that pair and see whether it is uh, over representation is there or not. Otherwise, we are happy to, uh, so far we are using the MSI uh, to select our uh, bidding pairs. But uh, when we selecting the uh, bidding pairs, then we really look for the, to find the mate. Basically, uh, they, they, they tell you the uh, start book number that you can pair this animal to that animal. But then we need to really look at the age and the health and the behavioral history of the animal. Some animal may be not healthy for some reason, and they are not a good mother. Suppose some animal is not a good mother uh, from her previous breeding session, so we don't actually try to ignore her. Then is this pair is compatible? It's, it's very interesting. Uh, otherwise, the, the results of uh, failure of breeding. Correct social grouping. You cannot keep two males uh, together or two bidding together or, uh, or male and female together in one bidding enclosure. So you have to, they need to, need to give them a complete isolation, so one male with a one female. And if you put two male to male together in during breeding season, they will kill, kill each other. Then uh, how do we introduce each other? Suppose if unknown male and female, we usually keep them in the adjacent enclosure so that they can spell each other and then we pair them. And uh, from our study and also from our observations, we know uh, they are ready to met from late November. Uh, so we try to bring the male female together uh, during late November to early December. And they usually form a pair bond and we give them enough behavioral security and they met. Uh, one of the study with the Lacons uh, on the um, uh, your Fecal hormone is done for first time. Uh, we are able to detect the progesterone uh, from the fecal hormone and the testosterone from the uh, from the male, and it tells us uh, the breeding seasonality. So you can see this male data. It's it's like a getting charts from the September of uh, October to uh, and going up till uh, January. So that was the timing we, we uh, put the male and female together. And also you see the progesterone level, it's going up and then it suddenly drop when they give, give babies. So, so the pregnant females are, uh, had significantly high fecal progesterone metabolites and concentrations compared to the non-pregnant female. So it was also uh, Obvious from this, this study, and we are we have a plan to continue this study with more data and with uh, more information to be included in this particular study in future. And how we manage the breeding pair? Uh, 
usually when the, we saw the female is pregnant and she's no more interested with the male, we particularly separate uh, the male from the female and give her one complete isolated uh, room. And then we improve her uh, food with more protein. Then uh, she will take care of her. She build her nest and she will be there. And we allow her to do her job by herself. We don't intervene during bidding. And we also went that there will be lactating mothers. We give enough scope to exhibit her natural behavior, take care of her babies. Once we try the hand rearing, because, because they usually give uh, four, four babies or five babies max. Sometimes one pair, one case, there was a seven babies. And the female, they have only six, uh, three pairs of mema. So she was unable to uh, rear her baby. So we took two babies in our hand. We try once. And after a month, we put them back. So it was uh, just tried once. And then it was successful, really, but it was not easy to uh, hand rear uh, babies in, uh, in, in captivity. It, it needs lots of effort and it's re really difficult. Then uh, reproductive control, as I said before, we tried once how we control the reproductions. Usually sex separations is ideal way, but it needs space. It needs uh, money and uh, additional effort. And, and uh, I think at that time, uh, I'm, I'm talking about before the regular email thing, I wrote to an uh, email to, to Dr. Crick Patriarch, who designed the Procyon Jodopathic vaccine. I mean, for, I mean, there's uh, contra contraceptive for pigs, but I, I, it was not possible to use for sweet because it's from the same Procyon species. So he advised us to use Depopravara. We used Depopravara and we successfully control Bidding and this animal came back for again a stress. We can uh, really able to beat that, those those two females. And assisted reproduction, we have still not used any assisted reproduction techniques, but likely to explore what is the possibilities of this assisted reproduction. Maybe in future we may need it. So far, 176 liter born with 680 babies, uh, and we are 450 reared up to the age of three months. And we are maintaining the 80 plus populations in two breeding centers. And we are sending uh, at least 10 to 15 individuals for the introduction every year. Uh, for reintroduction, Mihir, do I have time? Mihir? Yeah, yeah, you have, you have time, 10 minutes. Okay. So, so for reintroduction, uh, uh, we uh, have a quite bigger uh, setup in near Namiri National Park uh, in Potasali. We have uh, pre-release enclosures, uh, which was we have created the grassland in that particular area, and we release uh, when the babies are five months old, five six months old. We took them from a different family group to that enclosure and reared them separately in four four different groups. Also, we select babies from different families and then put them together and rear them uh, without human interventions. And by the time they are, uh, they, are taking, they can take care of themselves. But sometimes we add one or two uh, any individuals from the previous year. So we keep them there for another five, six months. And from them, from uh, that, we start releasing them. We usually release animals between uh, May and early June, uh, because at that time, uh, the grass grows well and there are lots of resources available in the grassland. So we send them, but how do we say like, where do we release the animal? I see the entire South Himalayan regions, or a region where the, there were grassland, but it was restricted to uh, only in few pockets at this moment. So at this moment, we are concentrating in Assam we are looking for uh, is looking for some sites in Sonairupai, Bornodi, Orang, and Manas National Park. But how we really select those areas? So we design few criteria like historical range, and we look for a uh, habitat compositions. This is grass and, grass and assemblies, a soil type, and also flood is the situations and area. What is uh, the area? It came up later because now after doing the radio telemetry, we know what is the area they require to have a good population establishment. So it was three to five square kilometer area. So we, based on that, we have selected those areas 
and we also start intervening on the habitat management. As I said, there was uh, lots of issues on the habitat, particularly the burning timing and burning regime and their encroachment of the area by the invasive weeds and also the continuation of the successions, those and categories, of course. So based on uh, our research on a PhD student on the habitat, we design all these uh, different uh, way to uh, improve the habitat. And by doing that, we have released uh, pygmy, 142 pygmy hog from uh, uh, Sonairupai, uh, Orang, and Bornodi, and uh, recently very uh, Manas. Uh, but uh, are we successful in all, all areas? No. In Sonairupai, we are not able to uh, uh, success, showing success also in Bornodi. And we find out why. Those areas are not as big as we needed. And those uh, data came later because we are not able to successfully monitor with the radio telemetry. I'll come to you at that point. So how we monitor the re reintroduced animals? Definitely after the burning, we look for their signs. We uh, now successfully introduce camera trap and we are able to monitor them through camera traps. And we work for a long time to really fix a radio telemetry device on the pygmy hog, but all our uh, approach of fitting the external device fail because they move so fast in the grassland and it was not possible for, uh, for them to retain the device on their body. So we went to an internal implants. Uh, we designed it in the veterinary university Vienna. And we are at this moment using that and giving us a data about a year and we have very good data. And that data tell us that we need really a area about three to five square kilometer. So that was included in our uh, criteria. And that's why we, we failed a, in Bordodi and Surairupai. But we are very successful in Urang National Park. So Urang National Park, a population grows and spreading in different areas. And, and, in, in, and we saw uh, in our camera trap, baby born in Orang. And their population is spreading in many different areas. So it tells us uh, our success. So, but at this moment, let's me going back to our initial model of a happy hog model. Have we tested that? Are they really happy? So do we have really any indicators uh, for testing our model? At this moment, we have not done any physiological investigations to test the model, but our breeding success, our success in the reintroduction, tell us that definitely that model of managing the pygmy hog in captivity is a real success. And that's how we are able to breed them continuously in our breeding centers. We are able to maintain the genetic diversity, which was proved by the software, also by the recent study conducted by the LACONS. And also uh, population is breeding in the wild and population is investigating. So it doesn't mean that we are not looking for any uh, recent uh, way of conducting or testing our model. Uh, we are in the process of designing research uh, for testing those uh, the, the models. So at what stage of the recovery of our species? If you see, there is a, a, a matrix of uh, really testing uh, the stages of recovery from dependence to independent. So we are in between the, uh, I mean, from bottom between the second and third, in between second and third, where we are sustaining the wild as a result of captive release and also continuous interventions to restore the habitat of, for the species. So we, be, we are somewhere in still in lower states. So we need to really move to make them independent. And if in this matrix, if you see, uh, we are in the middle stage, uh, somewhere between the intensive management to adaptive management stage. And, hope, and, and if we would, would not have stepped uh, down, uh, uh, take our actions, for saving the species, it would have been extinct by now. 
And in the recent publications, it was shows that 48 species safe from extinction by conservation efforts, and one of them was pygmy hawk. But how long it will take? If you see a recovery species really uh, take long, the, for example, the Californian condor and our American peregrine falcon or black ferret or gray wolf, all these American species, it took really long. It's hugely expensive and it's long. It took about, I think, 36 years. So we have crossed 25 years, so maybe 10, 15 years more. But what are the new challenges coming up? Recently, we have conducted a research on the climate risk assessment for sub Himalayan grassland. It's really alarming. From our research, we found that maybe in a few Dr. years back. Yes. I think we are we were lost you in the last slide. Oh, you lost me last slide? Here you lost me last Yeah, yeah you were not audible until last slide. Like half. Yeah. Half it. From here? Yeah, yeah, from here. So okay. I, I was hearing, I was hearing. Uh, okay. Yeah, no one was hearing. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then we can continue. I could hear, yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Ahead, so I'm, I'm telling here, I'm telling here, Mihir, it may take uh, usually those examples from the US species recovery plan. It took 36 years. So those are the successful recovery plans. So we are uh, still not uh, that timeline. Uh, maybe we have to work uh, again a few more years. I mean, 10, 15 years to really establish the population. Uh, now, uh, the challenges. Uh, one challenge is, you know, obviously the climate risk. Uh, so we uh, conducted a master's research in last year, or no, beginning of this year, to look what might happen to the sub-Himalayan grassland. And situation will be really bad for, particularly for this northeastern region. So we may need to think about what, how we go ahead. And very recently, or not very recently, it was last year, a disease called African swine fever. It's arrived Assam from China. And this is a very deadly disease for pigs, and there is no treatment, no vaccinations, and you know it's, it's, it's creating havoc in China or most of the European countries. So it can really, really wipe out populations very quickly. And we are just few hundred animals left in the wild and few only individuals in the captivity. So it's not even 500 animal or maybe nearly 400 animal. So we are under serious threat and this disease can really be a driver of extinction again. So we are under a level three kind of biosecurity protocols now, maintaining in our both the breeding, breeding, breeding centers. What next? How we, uh, how we go ahead? I mean, I mean, this, is, this may not be a joke. This may be a, a way to save a species. Uh, and I'm not sure how we're going to tackle those issues and how, what we're going to do with our pygmy hawk, assisted migration. Anyway, uh, how we are going ahead. Can I have a few minutes, Mahir? Yeah, you Mahir, can, can I have a few minutes? Yeah, you can have five minutes. Okay. okay. So uh, since 2017, we, we designed a uh, new uh, to take our project forward uh, by 2025. Gerald Dyle will be at 20, 100 years of his birth uh, and centenary, about a new centenary. So, so what we design, we design a new strategic rewild our uh, world. And in that uh, uh, strategy, we are looking for working very closely with the habitat and the communities and uh, populations. So our strategy uh, says recover threatened species of wildlife, uh, not only pygmy hawk, uh, or with other species also uh, in the grassland of Manas. And reviving the ecosystem, we are now putting lots of stress on habitat restorations and also training the local managers and people for habitat restorations. We try to reconnect the, uh, uh, reconnect the uh, people with the nature again. So hope. Uh, this is not going to be a future for only pygmy hog, but the future for all uh, in around Manas. So we have a new plan to take our project forward. We have uh, we have uh, restructured the pygmy hog species action plan by IUCN for 2030, and it will take us beyond us time to work the entire sub and grassland. Thank you. Mira, I've done. Thank you very much, Dr. Parag, for the wonderful talk.
uh, there are few questions will you be able to take them sure uh, first question is from uh, mr dipul now that the pygmy hogs have been reintroduced into manas at a boyanpara range after 1996 capture for captive breeding has there yes. been any phenotypic or genotypic variation observed in captive bred animals compared to the founder wild stock i think not recent studies by lacons so that the 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 we are able to retain retain the both genotypic of course and phenotypic uh thank you second question is uh, from raj mohan why pygmy hog is present only in specific regions can it be introduced in other parts of india okay that's very interesting thing i mean pygmy hog is is a, a we call it is a, a health indicator of the grassland of sub himalayan region it is only in the sub himalayan grassland they are so dependent on grass the grass grassland tall grassland particularly uh, they need to uh, cut grass they build their nest and uh, live inside the nest they go around the uh, 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 grasses for uh, eating roots and tubers and also lots of insects i'm not sure why they are because they they may be specific to only only the entire grass and even if you see the paleo biological study it tells that pygmy hog is always in that sub himalayan region the porcula is always in the sub himalayan region i think it it's a uh, nature it's uh, it's nature and <laughs> natural nature thank you uh, there is one final question from dr umapati how do you manage mm-hmm. to get support from forest department and central government so long years Oh, this is a partnership program. That's their project. We are just uh, we are just uh, caretaker. That's that thank is the project of uh, for the department project. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Parag. Uh, now I request to be here to uh, in- introduce and invite our next speaker, Dr. Gauri Malak. Just one minute. Thank yes. you for giving me opportunity to talk uh, in this. Uh, uh, I mean, esteemed society of uh, scientists, and uh, and hope I will take uh, the message my message across. Thank you all at at uh, Blackons. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Doctor. Me here, over to you. Thank you, Gopi. So our next speaker is Doctor Gauri Mullah. Dr. Gauri Mallapur is an eco-warrior, a passionate herpetologist with an unquantifiable eagerness to push boundaries. She has a master's in veterinary sciences from Bombay, Bombay Veterinary College and a diploma in sustainable development and natural history management from the Ecological Society Pune. In addition, she has completed a year-long course in basic herpetology from Bombay Natural History Society. She is currently working as a veterinary consultant with Central Zoo Authority in New Delhi, India. Her previous research experiences include a subject matter specialist on a project entitled Biodiversity Conservation and Ganga Rejuvenation under the Agency of Wildlife Institute of India and the National Mission for Clean Ganga. This project has focused on conservation, rescue, and rehabilitation of aquatic macrofauna. She has also been assistant director and veterinarian at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust Centre for Herpetology and Associated Project. She is invited member of IUCN SSC Crocodile Specialist Group. So I invite Dr. Gauri Malapur for her presentation. Thank you very much, Mihir. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll just share my screen. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. You can just show slideshow. Is yeah. this okay now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to uh, speak today at. the uh, advertcon 2021 and the topic i have for discussion is husbandry implications for reproductive success in reptiles and i'm going to basically look at health welfare and reproduction as a unit here so uh, to start off with just a brief about uh, the species that we're going to talk about uh, currently uh, the current world reptiles are classified into four groups or orders so we have squamata that includes snakes and lizards crocodilia which has crocodiles alligators caimans and gharials and uh, about uh, 27 species of crocodilia uh, extant today uh, chelonia uh, which is turtles and tortoises so we have uh, marine turtles freshwater turtles and land tortoises and rhynchocephalia where we have only the tuatara which is a representative of that species um so the best place to start is at the very beginning 
uh, and early influences are very important when we are looking at uh, rearing conditions, short term interventions and their long lasting effects when we are looking at reptiles. They are quite precocious, but these influences are long lasting. These effects may not be apparent immediately, but they influence the health and well being of the animals in captivity and determine how well or poorly they will do especially if we are going to consider releasing any animals back into the wild. Everything with reptiles centers around metabolism and metabolism in reptiles is basically dependent upon temperature. They're poikilothermic and therefore everything centers around the temperature and the niche habitats that they occupy. So each species has its own distinct metabolism and even though species might be very similar in appearance, or they might have evolved on opposite end of the world and they appear similar, their needs vary significantly. Uh, temperature variations play a very important role in the metabolic rate and because this, depend, uh, this determines how much food is consumed and what their physiological activities will be, how they move about reproduction, uh, you know, their activities on land and in water and so on. So illness, reproduction, growth, everything is equally impacted by metabolism and eventually by the temperature that they, uh, temperature niches that they occupy. Um, to speak a little bit about reptile diseases, um, the, in captivity, generally, they're very good patients. Although they're slow to heal, they're also slow to fall sick and deteriorate. Uh, if they're given good husbandry conditions to live in. Understanding natural history uh, is important for us to understand the physiology, especially when we're dealing with veterinary interventions in reptiles. And when they're placed in a good environment with good husbandry, reptiles can be quite tough and uh, they are able to sustain quite a bit of uh, you know, the issues that we sometimes see them dealing with. So if we're trying to recognize disease, it's generally, you know, the first question is they're just, uh, they don't move very much. They're extremely energy conservant when they're in their behavior. So how would you do this? Just because you're not seeing anything doesn't mean that it isn't there or it isn't happening. So changes in appearance, changes in behavior, uh, the shape, size, color, texture, the way their body parts appear, uh, whether, you know, it, it generally, uh, you know, when, when it's not moving around very much, it looks dead. If there is stargazing, it seems uncomfortable. It's occupying a position more than it normally would. Uh, basking more, being in water more, these things are uh, indicative of an issue. And understanding the normal behavior and recognizing these aberrance from normal is what will help you identify and recognize disease in these animals. Clinical examination is going back to the very basics when it comes to reptiles, auscultation, percussion, palpation, which are quite common when we deal with mammals, are not of that much value when we deal with reptiles. Um, so ob observing behavior alertness, uh, observation of the integrity, uh, integrity of the in integument, the skin, or the way their eyes appear, whether they are bright or whether there is a sunken appearance, presence of any external parasites, the way the tail is placed, whether it's flopping, whether they're able to swim very well, the quality of the teeth, especially in crocodilians, uh, whether they are transparent, opaque appearance or they're glossy. These are great indicators of the basic health stress level of the animals and so on, including things like just looking at soles of the feet. They will tell you in which direction to look at and to identify if there are potential problems that you need to be aware of. Even if you see these lesions, sometimes it's difficult to interpret the impact on the reptile survival. So uh, keeping a close eye and monitoring your animals carefully uh, every day, as often as you can, and if you're doing any studies in the wild, uh, monitoring the animal's behavior is very important. Uh, in general, uh, diseases, I have just classified them as infectious, non-infectious, viral emerging, parasitic, and uh, specifically some diseases that can be attributed to reproductive uh, system conditions. 
but all of these if we uh, if we look at them uh, either individually as in groups are dependent on a few things related to temperature and husbandry abscesses can be internal or external but it depends on how well the environment is maintained most of these diseases you will see related to uh, you will see them more predominantly in captive conditions we also have stomatitis uh, which is inflammation of the gums and uh, inflammation of uh, the mouth parts and this can these abscesses and stomatitis can very easily lead to septicemic conditions Uh, and the first thing to do with this is to make sure that the temperature that the animals are maintained at is uh, appropriate, and they can be supplemented with antibiotics and fluid therapy for recovery. Diabetes mellitus is being uh, studied in uh, chelonians, specifically in turtles and tortoises, and uh, you can identify this with increased amount of sugars in the urine samples that can be taken, and uh, that. the one of the other indicators is that uh, turtles and tortoises seem to get more hungry when they might have diabetes mellitus conjunctivitis here infections are very common uh, conjunctivitis in snakes uh, inflammation below the eye caps ear infection in freshwater turtles abnormal beak growth uh, secondary nutritional hyperparathyroidism which we would more commonly known uh, know as metabolic bone disease these are all uh, related to uh, understanding nutrition and the needs of the animal uh, not all turtles are uh, not all turtles and tortoises are vegetarian some need more protein diet but not all need a very high protein diet so more is not merry when we are trying to do uh, an understanding of the nutrition that we need to give the animals and supplementation in captivity with calcium or with vitamin d3 has to be a measured exercise so uh, generally we see abnormal beak growth which is uh, basically a lack of calcium and d3 and the development of the skull bones is uh, not appropriate which is why there is not uh, the closing of the beak is not appropriate and there is a, uh, not enough wear and tear so this affects the feeding and that can lead to nutritional deficiencies dehydration uh, and other uh, malnutrition related issues that are there gout is also seen quite commonly in um, uh, in chelonians and even in some crocodilians and if you identify it early enough uh, the same drugs that are used to treat gout uh, in human beings can be used in animals and radiology is a great way to identify this dissectitis is this ecdysis and dermatophytosis is mainly a husbandry related issue when there's high humidity or the substrate is not being cleared appropriately uh, these things can happen ulcerative or necrotic dermatitis septicemic ulcerative uh, skin disease in uh, turtles these are all related to um, in uh, inappropriate husbandry conditions uh, mainly in reptiles so viral and emerging diseases and we seem to have more of those coming up uh, herpes virus has been around for a long time adenovirus which is there which causes gastrointestinal symptoms and can be diagnosed using uh, liver biopsies retrovirus papillomas which are seen even in uh, cancer related issues with some reptiles inclusion body disease of boid snakes and we have seen them in pythons also is a problem we need to isolate these snakes and treat them appropriately uh, manage better biosecurity conditions uh, remember the importance of quarantine and biosecurity when uh, there are animals that are rescued or whether there are in, uh, exchanges because these diseases are now coming up quite a bit and there is now an emerging disease of the chrysosporium related fungi it is seen in quite a bit of um, uh, snakes now ophidiomyces ophidiocola is the name of the uh, fungi that we see and uh, it's an emerging disease and that has caused quite a bit of problems in some species of corn snakes etc in the united states um reptiles also get parasitic infections everything from roundworms to ticks mites leeches pentastomids flagellates and these generally 
affect uh, different systems and make them poor doers. So they, uh, like all parasites do, would uh, uh, affect the nutritional uptake and make the animals weaker. So uh, deworming can, in, in, in captivity, it is recommended that deworming be done only with regular testing. And if you uh, see the parasite, then a specific treatment is initiated for that particular parasite. And we don't normally now do a generalized deworming on a regular basis. Uh, whereas if you are bringing in animals from the wild or if you see them, then you generally would look at the impact of this parasite on having a passive immunity thing with the reptile and therefore then treat judiciously. Uh, we look at reproductive diseases and um, neutering is not very common in reptiles. So there are often, if there is a nutritional imbalance or there is an imbalance in the amount of uh, uh, the, you know, the thermal regulation that is av available for the reptile or the kind of substrate that would be needed for the animal to uh, deposit the eggs, then you would see egg retention and dystopia. Uh, there are hormonal diseases and supplementation is used for this. They can lead to dystopia as well, as well as vent prolapses where there are organs uh, like the phallus can, uh, or the cloaca, all these prolapses can happen. We have seen follicular stasis as well. But this is generally related to nutrition. And in any kind of program where we're looking at captive breeding or captive rearing of these animals, nutritional balances would help. Uh, avoid these kind of issues. So this is just a, a Chrysosporium related fungus in the various reptiles that is there. Ophidiomyces ophidiocola, which was, uh, it was a paper published in 2013 in snakes has become a problem. We have, we, we see it across reptile species and therefore keeping an eye on these kind of issues would be important. Uh, these are just some of the cases that we have seen over the years with uh, husbandry changes. This has helped, but these are some medical cases where there's subcutaneous ulcerative disease in uh, a soft shell turtle, eye and oral abscess in uh, a tortoise, uh, poor husbandry leading to some kind of foot ailments in a crocodilian. This is the beginning of uh, scud septicemic cutaneous ulcerative disease. It starts like these with small patches and you will see min my minimal uh, wounds starting here, but can progress very quickly if it is not attended to. Uh, bladder prolapse, prolapse of the phallus. And in addition to this, of course, there are injuries that happen when, um, you know, these turtles are in um, landscapes where there is human activity. So soft shell turtles where they occupy paddy fields and when the fields are being plowed, they go through these. But with intervention, you can actually uh, help them recover. So this was this is a before and after picture of a Lysimus punctata that had a cracked shell and we were able to repair it with some minimal intervention. Um, most solutions are simple dietary changes and management, whether it is uh, nutritional calcium deficiencies or generalized weakness nutritional deficiencies in turtles. When there are large clutches and large number of animals together, monitoring is a little difficult. So keeping a, an eye on the animals and identifying the poor doers and isolating them sometimes with assisted feeding will always help them do better. So monitoring is quite important when we look at these. Uh, this was a case of uh, possibly herpes virus in some animals. Herpes virus is generally brought on in um, turtles by stress and any kind of stressful situation, especially with the amount of trade happening now, can be a trigger for these uh, viruses to come up. So careful monitoring of species that are brought even in trade might be important when you're dealing with these reptiles. So uh, addressing disease can be done in three stages, medical management, husbandry and diet, which is ongoing and enrichment, which should be ongoing as well. Medical management, uh, in medical management, diagnostic tests are a huge help in identifying diseases in quick identification and therefore 
a better, smoother, faster resolution of the problem, which is medical management where you want to do uh, specific treatments or you want to have surgical intervention to solve, say, uh, if there is a case of egg retention or dystopia, then you will need to intervene surgically or do this. So you, a diagnostic test would help you get to that stage of decision. Husbandry and diets where in captivity generally your enclosure has to have all the attributes that would allow for good substrate, ability to keep the substrate clean and fresh, provide safety and security to the animals along with thermal niches so that they can achieve their preferred optimal thermal zones, which is very important for their metabolism and physiological processes of the body, provide appropriate diet and appropriate supplementation where needed. Enrichment allows for exercise, both physical and behavioral. It can be done uh, quite well with foods or just using all the other sensory abilities that the snakes have. Uh, pythons have uh, pits for thermal detection. They also have a good sensory palate. So then you can use different kinds of scents to improve their movement around the enclosure, improve spatial use, make sure that there is some environmental enrichment so that arboreal snakes have the ability to use, uh, you know, the height of the enclosure as well as the other uh, floor spaces that are available. So enrichment is important for them to, for behavioral, both physical and uh, psychological welfare of the animal. Uh, diagnostic tests, we start generally with phlebotomies where you're able to collect blood samples and we process them manually uh, for most hematology parameters. And uh, there are now machines available to help you with doing serum biochemistry. I always prefer to do uric acids as well because it helps in identifying basic liver disease and progressing further with that. So phlebotomy is simple across species. The radiology is a good boon uh, for us to do diagnosis, um, keeping a track on development of eggs in reproductive seasons. When you have breeding females in a population, it tells you how well they're doing and how well uh, you, you know, the eggs are developing, they're progressing in their reproductive cycles, and if you should intervene with needs for supplementation, etc. In animals that are brought to you specifically on rescue from trade, uh, checking for fish hooks or any other foreign material. Radiology is a great help because it's difficult to do checking otherwise. Um, metabolic bone disease, uh, which are there in some captive animals, it tells you the status of the animals when you are able to do uh, radiology. And if there is any foreign body or if there is any gut stasis, which might be related to an improper diet, this can be diagnosed easily. Uh, when we're looking at reproductive strategies, um, reptiles over their millions of years of development and evolution have developed different strategies all the way from mating systems, spans of reproductive life, retention of oviparity or the assumption of viviparity, the way the sex ratios are developed, relative sizes of males and females, uh, especially related to production of uh, eggs and where they lay the brood, interval between successive broods, and timing of various events in the reproductive cycle to involve climatic adaptation. So when in tropical areas, they generally would tend to lay eggs in a more wetter season so that there is no chance of desiccation of the eggs that are laid on exposed sandbanks, et cetera. And when, they, when the young hatch, they can provide for food and shelter, though it is in varying quality at different times of the year. So these reproductive strategies can be monitored also very well with x-rays to see uh, whether there is development of eggs. We have now started using ultrasonography for uh, identification of development of follicles and also the progress of the same. And uh, the latest uh, venture into laparoscopic interventions. Now I have specifically uh, used uh, this case study for us because this is uh, Batagut Pasca. It is the Northern River Terrapin. It's a critically endangered species of freshwater turtles, which 
is found only in the Sundarbans area in India. And uh, when we are looking at uh, strategies for conservation of species, because these species have temperature dependent sex determination, it is important for us to not only monitor the incubation uh, of the eggs in this animal, but post incubation, we need to identify the sexes of the animal before they're put back in the wild so that the population that is reintroduced is a viable population and we are contributing to a more viable population in the environment. The best way to do that in young animals before they attain uh, the characteristics of, you know, sexually dimorphic characteristics, which is there in some species. So you see the male here is brightly colored, but this is only this only happens in uh, the breeding season and the female has a more uh, dull coloration. So before these sexually dimorphic characters can be identified, the best way to do it is uh, laparoscopically, you can identify, look for the ovaries or the testes, and that tells you what uh, the species are. I must admit that uh, laparoscopic intervention is a very new science when it comes to reptiles here in India. We're in our learning stages, but it's a good start, and hopefully, progress uh, will help us look at species conservation in a more broader scale when it comes to reptiles. Uh, I would like to speak here about a little bit about um, impacts of climate change because uh, in reptiles, since everything is so centered around the importance of temperature, climate change impacts can be quite significant. And uh, reproduction in reptiles is closely tied to narrow windows of time in appropriate season when there is suitable temperature and moisture regimens are available. Uh, and we link these very closely to natural history activities such as foraging, mating, availability of appropriate uh, areas for the animals to lay their eggs and so on and so forth. And in species like crocodilians and turtles, the dynamism of the river. So altered weather conditions during these seasons may result in frequent or recurring lost years and reproductive failure. This, in general, would impact uh, populations of species that are, uh, you know, uh, are already facing declines. Other climatic climatic effects can in, uh, that can happen include mortality associated with warm spells in winters, interacting effects of altered vegetation communities, invasive species, and these leading to potential disease outbreaks. In, in, especially in crocodilians and turtles, the effects can be threefold. Since they are mostly aquatic, these species, altered habitats and increased habitat fragmentation with altered climate, sensitivity to changes in water availability and its thermal properties. So this can affect this. And also um, when the eggs are laid, if there are significant changes in temperature, then because of their temperature sensitive sex determination, the way the uh, hatchlings are produced in the nests would be significantly altered, altering the sex ratio of the populations and potentially affecting future reproduction and compromising evolutionary fitness over time. So when we are addressing strategies to uh, consider uh, population declines, uh, of course, everyone starts with the protection and enhancement of natural habitats and looking at how these can be protected so the species can recover on its own. But we also have to consider effective strategies for conservation of species and reintroduction planning with setting up of assurance colonies and ex situ conservation measures, including uh, assisted reproduction techniques, which can be a part of how the assurance colonies are managed and how the numbers are augmented in these assurance colonies. Uh, a case in point to this is uh, the Raphitis swinhoi, the Yangtze giant soft shell turtle, which is on the verge of extinction. And currently there are only three individuals of this species extant in the world today. And the picture on the left is how this is the only way they're able to monitor the presence of this species in Vietnam. There are two individuals in Vietnam, but they haven't been sexed yet. 
and there is just one uh, male that is available in captivity but unfortunately he's also had an injury to the phallus so the quality of the sperm deposition um is not as appropriate and we haven't been able to have any viable fertile eggs over the past many years with this species so artificial insemination was attempted five times but it hasn't resulted in any egg development and this paper was published in 2015 um in general artificial reproduction techniques in reptiles have received sporadic uh, attention there is uh, there are more and better studies i think with amphibians but uh, reptiles has been slightly um, on the back foot as of now this could possibly be because of the differences in the fertilization environment and sperm physiology and morphology the use of these technologies can be more challenging in reptiles the reproduction of reptiles though is very similar to birds and therefore using uh, the model for birds may offer a potential for the use of similar technologies in reptiles uh, in addition to this reptiles also have some phenomenal adaptations of delayed development of eggs where they can retain the eggs and retain sperm both in males and females and only use these effectively when the environmental temperatures are suitable there is oviductal sperm storage which has been noted not only in turtles but also in some species of crocodilians though uh, admittedly this is only noted in captivity and uh, there i i i am not aware of any uh, of these records from the wild parthenogenesis is also noted in reptiles we have this in komodo dragons and also in some other species it is now pertinent that if gene banks are not established for threatened species of reptiles the alarming rate of loss of their genetic variation will continue and possibly accelerate this loss will translate into lowered species survival both in captivity and nature and it would be prudent for us to think in uh this direction right away so i will end with the words of robert frost where we say that there is miles to go before i sleep thank you thank you very much dr gauri uh we have few questions uh, will you be able to take them uh dr gauri are you muted yes i'm happy to take any questions uh first question is from khali <laughs> i'm sorry any genetic First, first question first. is from dr kali yeah any genetic disorders or carcinomas that are observed or prevalent in reptiles uh genetically i don't know i don't have the answer to that question though carcinomas are common they are related to papilloma it's uh, there could be a viral origins as well but i am not aware of any uh, genetic uh, implications of carcinoma Uh, next question is from Mr. Deepul. Uh, yes. Are penial prolapses common in captive reptiles, especially turtles and crocodilians? And what are the major husbandry solutions, other than nutrition, as you mentioned, to reduce its occurrences in turtle and crocodiles? Uh, it is common. Um, penial prolapses, phallus prolapses, can happen both in turtles and crocodilians. I have seen them related to. There could be. well nutrition and temperature is you know there is no escape from that that's the that's the crux of how uh, reptiles have to be managed in captivity so because of the nutritional or the husbandry issues that are there if there are stones possibly uh, in the bladder or a large parasite load or uh, you know uh, if there are males competing and the number of animals that are there in the enclosure is inappropriate then these things can happen so it's there i unfortunately there is no one size fits all answer for this it has to be looked at uh, in its entirety and each problem will have a you know there is no uh, well if there is a penile prolapse to one two three four things and you never have it again unfortunately there is no simple way to answer that question but if you are able to keep the number of animals in an appropriate enclosure provide them with appropriate nutrition temperature then the chances of hap- uh, this happening will be fewer uh 
third question is from dr romapati are there any zoonotic diseases from reptiles um yes um from reptiles to people the most common one is salmonellosis and the solution to that is very simple when you handle the reptiles then you have to keep your uh, you know you keep your hygiene good you you make sure that you wear gloves and if you do handle them then you go and wash your hands so salmonellosis is the biggest thing uh, i know that there are some viral uh, you know there was some uh, how do i say it there was there was a direction which said that even covid came from snakes but i am not sure i don't have enough information about this there are no other uh, direct implications of diseases from reptiles to human beings uh, dr romapati has raised his hand uh, sir you can yeah. unmute yourself and ask uh, this is a wonderful talk and a very extensive information on uh, reptiles You Sorry, know. I ran through it rather quickly, though. I don't think forty minutes is good I, enough for me to the, do the whole reptile <laughs> gamut. But I hope it was good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good because uh, the, I, I don't know anybody is there in India to talk about reptiles <laughs> even in globally. Also, very few people are like you are working in this area. Wonderful. And I have only one uh, small clarification. Uh, as Karthik was working on microchytids uh, fungus. Yes. In, uh, is it also there in uh, zoos now? uh batrachochytium it's amphibian related uh, yeah yeah uh, yes. amphibian only yes it is in uh, we have seen it mm. but uh, uh, the uh, there are no clinical manifestations of that disease yet in india we it is only found on monitoring and we have been able to control it very well biosecurity measures have been put in place Mm-hmm. and since we have good testing and monitoring for it fortunately we haven't had any spread of that but uh, like i mentioned with reptiles when we are talking about uh, species that are so sensitive especially to environment conditions maintaining biosecurity is very important and we should be able to do that okay thank you thank you gauri once again no problem thank uh, you for the opportunity ma'am there is one last final question sure Yes, uh, Mr. Raj Mohan has asked. Can you please explain if there are any exotic reptile reptile impact on Indian biodiversity? Uh, well, firstly, if exotic reptiles are not managed appropriately, they will impact Indian biodiversity. So, ex- non-native species should be managed as such. They should not be uh, in the wild. We do. Um, in reality there are invasive reptile species we know that red eared sliders trachyma scripta is um, and because of trade it has been uh, significantly uh, brought into the country it is there with a lot of people as pets and uh, there have been incidences of it being found in the wild but uh, if awareness about the species is created and we continue to raise awareness then hopefully at some point we will uh, be able to deal with this issue uh, in in the broader scope but yes if it is unregulated and uh, non native species are put in the wild then there will be an impact on local diversity uh, thank you very much dr gauri and uh, i once again thank all the speakers and participants uh, for actively participating today uh, we shall now take a lunch break and uh, we'll be back by 2 pm in the standard time and uh, we have three more sessions uh, for the afternoon session so please be back at 2 pm ist thank you very much thank you thank you